I used to read my Bible say they were beaten with a rod. You don't understand that one? Do you get it? The difference between beating a man with cane and beating a man with rod. Rod. What is rod? Rod is an iron. It's an iron that no matter how they beat you, it will not break, it will not, they can't keep up. And they whip them with the rod. They whip them with the rod. They whip them. And when they saw that they did not die, I mean, he said, okay, put them in the prison. Do not just put them in the ordinary prison. In the real dungeon, I want, I seek. Make sure they were well secured. If it were me or you, what would you do at that moment when you are doing the work of God? You don't get it. When you left your comfortable job, where you are getting too good pay, when you have the honor, when you have the full glory, and you take that job that you hear that God call you, where was that God when Paul and Salah were being beaten with the rod, with the lashes? Listen, people of God, and Bible says they threw them into the jail. But when they got to the jail, they didn't bind, they didn't lose. But what? They just give thanks. Oh my goodness. They just thank God for the grace to be a partaker of your suffering. Hey, my goodness. How many of you were being ordinarily disappointed? I will say, God, I thank you for the disappointment because I know it is another opportunity to a greater high, to a greater level. But instead, what we see is what God is yet to do or what he has not done. We will not see what he has done and say, God, because this is just a saucer turning inside out, I will reverse it. Paul did not complain. Neither shall I say, Paul, you know, I didn't want to follow you. I have my ministry in Jerusalem. I don't like rural ministry. These people, they are uncivilized. They are dreadful. They can even kill a man. Did he say that? And Paul started a song and Salah be a good chorus. And they were singing. I'm talking to you that if you want to see the wonder of God, Giving a praise. If you want to demonstrate the power of God, give in a praise. You can't just jump into demonstration of power without invoking the presence of God into your life, into your situation, into that circumstances. And Bible say they were praising this Most High God, as they were praising Him, they forgot. You can't when you are praising God. And you are still remember something somewhere you are not started yet. Abba said they were praising they forgot themselves in the hand of God, the most high. That's why this evening I want us to praise him and invoke his presence. Because when you praise him, there shall be and there will be the demonstration of power. Higher, higher, higher. Aya 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 Jesus aya 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 Ha! 
Let me tell you what you are going through now, you will be going through. I say, whatsoever you are going through now, you will be going through. You will not get stuck. Listen to this. When you praise God, and God is coming to inhabit your praise, you will not only be, it's not only you that will be the beneficiary. Bible says when God came to inhabit the praises of Paul and Salah, his presence in the prison caused earthquakes. And the earthquake caused the doors of the prison to flood open on their own accord. And we had as God, there is liberty. Because in the presence of God, there is joy, not for a day, not for a moment, forever. And at his right hand, there is pleasure and no pressure. Pleasure and no pressure. Listen to this. As he entered that prison in his presence, the door opened because of the terrible earthquake. And not only that, Bible says everyone that was bound they was set loose. Was set loose. When the jailer realized it, they said they are gone. They wanted to take their life. Paul and Sarah, do not take your life. We are here. We are not running anywhere because we have taken dominion. This evening you are taking dominion of that situation and circumstances. I say you are taking dominion. By the anointing of Holy Ghost, you are taking dominion. You are taking do dominion. Paul said, do not kill yourself, do not take your life because we are still here. Because we are in control. Your situation is not in control. You are in control. And whatsoever you say to that situation, we surely answer for you tonight. That man, listen, the jailer, the jailer, jailer, they prostrated. They fell before Paul. They said, what must we do to be saved? Instant in the middle of the night, not in the day, they were baptized 2 a.m. They were baptized. We want, we want them to be saved. What will happen to you tonight, people of God? Generation will speak it. That eh, because of what happened in your life tonight, I too I must be saved. Ah, you don't get it, you won't get it. I, I, this man is a man of abundance. And a demonstration of power. Demonstration of power. They say, what we do? Can you imagine? They couldn't wait second day. They couldn't wait day break. That night, they go water baptism. You can know that it is, it is not a small, it's not a small encounter. The encounter you are going home with tonight. It will amaze you. He will dumbfound you. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the middle of the night, they go water baptism. As if that war is not you know. They were initially jailer. Instantly they turned to nurse. They said, say, where did we beat your time? And they were they were clean, they were clean their wound. They were clean their wound. They are clean their wound. Your enemy and your situation will begin to clean your wound. We begin to bow for you. As if that one is not enough, Bible says, you don't get it. They, they did not even bother about people that were in the jail again. They took Paul and Salah 
out of the east and they forgot the remaining there because they have been set free. You don't get it. Because they have been set free, the jailer cared less about the prisoner again. They were just cared about the Paul and Salah. They threw them out of jail to their house. Bible says instantaneously they set a table. They set a table. They become cook. They become everything. They set a table before them in the middle of the night. And they were eating and they were enjoying themselves. As if that one is not enough. Without nobody tell the magistrate. The magistrate said, you can go now. We have humiliated you enough. <laughs> you can go. Paul and Salah said, we are not going at that. You have humiliated us enough. We will live here with honor. I command by the anointing of Holy Ghost. You are going back home with honor. You are going back home for honor. Oh, Mahasada Yelebu. He said, oh, no, 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 no. We are, we are not listening to you, the jailer. Go and talk to your magistrate. Let your magistrate themselves come and tell us everything you have told us because we are not going to run away. The magistrate begged them. They honored them. So them, I don't care that as old wickedness. I don't care that as old strong man. I don't care that as old woman. Tonight themselves, they will bow. They will bow. They will bow to God in you. Jesus Christ was talking to his father. He said, as you have sent me, I have sent them. The same way you sent me, the same authority that I have with you, I have given to them. The same, the same authority that you are giving to me, I have given to them. As they have hear me, they will hear you. He said, therefore, go. Anyone that hears you, they hear me. Anyone that listens to you, they are listening to Jesus Christ. Tonight, as you are hearing me, you are hearing God. <laughs> Your situation is bad for you. Circumstances disappear before you. Turn around of every situation. In the name of Jesus Christ. You don't praise God over a situation. And the situation still remains the same. If you are praising God on your well, Lord, I thank you. Because this is the opportunity for you to manifest yourself. This opportunity for you to show yourself again. Begin to thank God on that situation. The Lord, I thank you. Because this is opportunity for you. To manifest your power again. This opportunity for you. To show yourself mighty on my behalf. Daddy I thank you. For another opportunity for you. To make yourself real. To make yourself mighty. Oh Lord I thank thee. Oh Lord I worship you. 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 I worship you. I worship you. I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Daddy, Lord. I worship you, King of Kings. I worship you. 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 For another opportunity. For another opportunity to make yourself real. To make yourself real. To make yourself real. Thank you, Jehovah Jerry. Thank you, El Shaddai. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. I need down upon this altar.
upon the rock of ages. All other ground is sinking sand. And I decree a decree. Whatsoever enemy thought that they are doing now against you, God begin to use it for you now. Everything the whole city of Macedonia, their king, their magistrate, their policeman, and their law authority thought that they were doing against Paul and Salah. He hand to Paul and Salah as honor and fame. Everything they have done against you, they are doing against you now. I hand it in on your behalf. Honor and fame. Glory and joy, peace and happiness, success all round. In the name of Jesus Christ, I release upon you and your destiny the power of the resurrection, the power of divine reversal, the power of divine turning point, the power of divine turn around. That let everything begin to turn around for your favor, for your honor, for your peace, for your joy, for your lifting, for your enlightenment. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Give God a hand, give God a hand, give God a hand. Give it to the king of kings. in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, our Father. We bless God, we bless God. We bless God. That was awesome. That was awesome. Give it to God. Give it to God, give it to God. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. I welcome everyone to today's study. Glory be to God that you are able to make it here. It's not by accident. It has been defined. Tonight, we are studying our lesson six. Jesus tells parables of the kingdom. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. King of glory, we bless your holy name. As we go into your word again, Father, open our wisdom, our sense of understanding, that we can understand better your word, and we can move closer to you, and we can apply it in our daily life, and we move us towards eternity, and we will not be wanting in eternity. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Jesus tells parables of the kingdom. We are studying the book of Matthew. That's what we studied last week too. So we continue from chapter 11 through 13. We have our study books. Turn to page 47. Page 47. And our lesson objective for tonight, we will be learning how Jesus used parables to describe the kingdom of heaven. 
Second, we will find out what happened when Jesus returned to his hometown. And third, we will appreciate the value of the kingdom of heaven. Praise the Lord. So let's begin with the first section, section A. So we're reading uh, 13, verse 24 through 30. Can someone read that? Matthew 13, 24 to 30. Jesus was talking in parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who so good who so good seed in his feet. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sow weeds among the wheat. Sowing weeds among the wheat. So in Jesus' parable of the weeds, a farmer's weak feet was sabotaged by an enemy who planted the weeds in it. The farmer decided to let the wheat and the weeds grow together until the harvest. Somebody plant wheat, a farmer planted wheat the enemy went there to scatter weeds to be growing with the wheat. So he wants to cause confusion, right? And but the farmer, instead of saying, Hey, I'm going to take all this wheat that this guy, the enemy, has scattered among the wheat. He said, I will let it, both the wheat and the weeds, to grow. I, I hope we understand what they mean by weeds. Weeds, they are the unwanted plant that are growing along with the crops that you planted. That's what we call weeds. And you want to take them out because you don't want them to mess up your crops. But in this instance, the farmer say, hey, I'll let them the wheat, both the wheat and the wheat, the wheat and the weeds to grow together until the harvest. Praise the Lord. So uh, Jesus likened the kingdom of heaven to a feed where good and bad seed were sown. The good seed planted by the farmer produced wheat. The bad seed planted by the enemy produced weeds. When the farmer's servant asked if they should pull the weeds, the master said no, since some of the wheat might be lost in the process. He told them to wait until the harvest. Let me put it to the church. Why do you suppose God decided to let the wicked thrive right alongside his people in this life? 
Or let me ask first, why do you think the farmer say, okay, I will allow these weeds to grow along with the wheat? Yeah. So, let me read the question again. Why do you suppose God decided to let the wicked thrive right alongside his people in this life? Hello, Pastor. Are you with us? Because if he, though he knew his enemy has planted weeds, he still had good plants inside. So as if we're thinking about God, we can think about this world. Though there's evil around that's planted in everything, but there are still good people. God would not annihilate everyone because he still have good people. So he'll wait. For until the time is ripe and remove his own from the thing and th those that are against him are sinful or evil those will be destroyed he has done it so many times in Sodom Gomorrah he does not annihilate his own people praise the Lord good answer because God didn't want in, in the process if, if we are talking about the farmer that he wanted to remove the weed at that stage it will destroy most of the wheat but when we're talking about wicked people and going along with uh, the good people praise the Lord hallelujah we, we all know this one, God's the God of second chance, and the work of good people is to convert the bad people. If there's no good people, where is the mission that God sent us to do? Who do we have first? When Jesus Christ came, he said, I did not come because of the, uh, the, the righteous. I came for the sinner. So he came properly to heal the sinner, to reap the sinner, to heal the sick, not the one that doesn't seek. If you, if you pack all the bad people in Baltimore, how many good people remain? So God, that is, the, is the work of the good people to go and convert the bad people. That's the mission work for us. And God help us in Jesus' name. That's it. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Evil people in the world, like um, my mommy and daddy have explained, fantastic. But when evil happens, it affects the good people. There are times when we've had hurricane, when we've had earthquake, that believers and Christians suffer from it. My question is this. 
Um, and it's, I mean, thought-provoking. Why would God allow those kind of evil to happen to even some of his children or most of his children that are found in those circumstances that are caused by these evil ones that are living amongst us? Thank you. Well, first correction. God didn't allow it. And thank God for you. You hear the hurricane that was to hit uh, Florida, North Carolina, and even Maryland. Even Maryland. I wonder why I didn't even tell that one in the church. Remember? We are just, I said, what's going on? He said the hurricane will hit Maryland. You may not know who you are in the law. I know who I am in the law. And me and why we pray. This hurricane, you don't even want to feel you, may like, not even that uh, the rain will disturb us because they said that the rain will stop us, so they said that we will not be able to come to church on that Sunday. But we didn't even feel it, we did not want to feel it because we know it's some people that stood in Florida and said, Not here. Some stood, in, uh, they're not if what you allow, what everyone allows. God cannot take away from you the thing you enjoy. When you enjoy sinning, God won't, God won't take it away from you. Except, say, I don't enjoy it. So, but I said, well, no. I don't know anybody who wants to talk again. That is it. God doesn't allow it. And I've told you before, as a God in person <coughs> and as a God in principle. God in person will release rain upon everybody, sun upon everybody, even on the same lot. But the lot of the righteous will get a better yield than the lot of the sinner. That, that God in principle. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And one thing I want to say about that situation is that before God will do a thing, he will let his people know. And one thing I know, it will go and make the census of people that have been perished and all those things. I know the righteous one will forever be preserved. Amen. Go and check Go and count it. You will see that the righteous are preserved. Whether hurricane, whether tornado, God will always protect his own children. So those people you see, I won't judge them. But what I know is that God always protects his own. Praise the Lord. Sorry to cut you, sir. I want to give you a testimony. One hurricane, like this hurricane tsunami that happened in Pakistan, India, and over 500, 800,000 people died. One, 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 one pastor was taken care of overage. He said, suddenly, God already prepared for it. He didn't prepare. It was not a rain, tsunami. Just, wow. He said, and that thing just overwhelmed the building. And it took away all the 22. And he remember a fact. When God framed the creation, he set a boundary. He said, you, ocean, you have exceeded your boundary. He said, it's soon into the ocean. One by one, he rescued 22 child. And none of them have any problem. You remember that one? He spread the word of God. And he took it to the ocean. You ocean, you have exceeded your boundary. When you are created, he said, and he set a boundary for the sea. With that just one understanding, he rescued those 22 of our nation. That's what we are talking about. Only those who know their God, we do exploit. We do exploit. Hallelujah. Thank you, Bishop. And God will preserve us in Jesus' name. Let's follow that up with the second question I have here. It says, since we must live with unbelievers, are you listening, my brother? How should we act with them? That's a follow-up question to the first one. Since we must live among them, so we, the believers, how should we be acting among the unbelievers. Um, if I 
was to live amongst the believers, which which truly we do find ourselves in this world. I mean, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. So basically, I believe our life should be a light to them. We should set a clear example that, yes, we are bought with a price, washed with his blood. And, I mean, our life should be a Bible to them, basically, that, yes, we are different from from um, from them because if we are yes we're in the world with them but if we now start acting like them then what is the difference so our life should represent christ that's why we are called christians we are christ like so we have to act like, like christ. christ praise the lord grandma you want to add to that oh okay okay we should also uh, be able to sympathize with them. Maybe when they are passing through one thing or the one thing or the other, we should we as a Christian need to sympathize with them. We should not just say because we are believer, we cannot go closer to them or do what we're supposed to do. We should be able to sympathize with them. Praise the Lord. I will heard that when you are living among you know these people are wicked. So, <laughs> so, okay, we, as we are living among the, we refer to them as unbelievers. We need to be wise. The believers, we need to be cautious. And we need to be very, very careful. The way we live among them, the way we deal with them, we have to be, even though, like, we have to act, we have to behave Christ-like, so we have to be as, as we are as gentle as dove, we need to be wise as serpent, so that we don't, we don't destroy ourselves along with them. Praise the Lord. Ah, okay, that's another one. So that they, we don't try to emulate them when you see them in a way, maybe you feel they are thriving, but that thriving may lead to destruction. So we need to, to be wise. My other question, let me have another question for us. What can Christian gain by God's allowance of the presence of evil in the world? Yoruba will say to be Tirela Dalia. What can Christian gain by God's allowance of the presence of evil in the world? <laughs> Maybe. It makes us to understand God's uh, uh, nature and it also it will enable us to understand the, the complexity of uh, the human you know, uh, society because as Christians we will understand their predicaments and we will find ways and means by which we can be useful in ministering to those who may you know, uh, eventually become Praise the Lord. Yeah, it help us to understand who God is and how powerful he is. What about the grace of God on us? Do we think about that? What about his protection? When we live among the wicked people and he's still protecting us every day, we need to appreciate God. So one kite, I mean, what can it cost us? We are living among the, the wicked people. So what can it cost us? So it can affect us in many ways. So it can cost us our attention. 
So if you are not wise and know how to behave, you might be distracted. It can cause life, it can harm you, so which may lead to destruction. Praise the Lord. Because of our time, let's move down to the next uh, part, part B. Part B say the mustard seed and the yeast. Um, that's Matthew, but uh, because of our time, let me just brief this. Say the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his feed. We know mustard seed, it's a very small seed. Jesus used parables about a planted mustard seed and yeast in dove to explain the growth potential of the kingdom of heaven. The little seed produces a large plant. That's the little mustard seed. And the yeast, we know what, what does yeast do to, uh, to dough, to bread? Causes a lot of bread to rise. By teaching parable like this, Jesus fulfilled scripture. Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven to a mustard seed which grows into a large plant. Similarly, he compared the kingdom to yeast, which works its way through a big batch of dough. Both parables make the same point. The kingdom, though seemingly insignificant at first, grows greatly. Praise the Lord. So with that explanation, story. So, um, yeah, there's a little story here. Say, there once was a father who decided it was time to give a son an allowance. The figure of five dollars a week seemed fair to him. The son replied, I will make it easy for you, dad. Let's start out with a penny. The dad wants to give $5 a week, but the son says, hey, let me make it easy for you, daddy. Let's start with a penny the first day and double it each successful day. Then, when the month is over, we will start all over again. The Which one you think will be better? To give five dollar a week, but the son say, "Hey, daddy, give me a penny a day, and each day we double it." Yeah. Now it's like he get a penny today, he get two tomorrow, and he get four the following day. Then he gets 16 the following day. So, <laughs> so. so, why do you think it's better? Okay. The plants and they go to the father and he agreed. How much did the father owe the son on the 13th day? Did anybody, can anybody quickly do the calculation? Or you can make a guess. On the 13th day, it's not the whole month. Oh. I mean, okay, at the 30th day. At the end of the month. <laughs> you 
can't make a guess. Who is a good mathematician here? It's not even close. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right, let's move on. He said, on the thirtieth day, the father owed the son five million three hundred and sixty eight seven oh nine dollars. <laughs> so. So it be owing the it will be owing the son. So instead of the son to get twenty dollar, he will be getting five million after the end of the month. <laughs> so uh if if we apply this to our daily living, let's say, um, for, for example, Bible reading. If you are able to read a chapter or you start a fast, just a fast of a chapter, maybe tomorrow or the next day you increase it to two fasts of the Bible. Before you know it, you'll be reading a chapter a day, as time goes on, you do two chapters a day. And you, you do it with your understanding. What about prayers? Prayer, what about your prayer life? Maybe if you can pray, you meditate a word today, maybe just a fast. You use it to pray. Get the understanding. Before you know it, it can expand. And you see that maybe you just walk in you, the way you meditate on the word of God, the way you pray, you increase in your prayer strength, and you get more understanding how to communicate with your father God. Praise the Lord. I hope we learn something there. Praise the Lord. Um... All right, let me ask this question too. We are still on part B. Can we draw a parallel between this story and God's kingdom? We did that already? <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. So what reasons might Jesus have, must have had for using parables? Jesus is using parable to talk to his disciples to the people. Do we see any sense in that? What do we think might be some reasons why Jesus used parables and not talking to them directly? Excuse me? Seems like I hear grandma saying something. Can you say it louder? that it will make them understand what Jesus was teaching them or was talking about. Praise the Lord. For better understanding, many people learn when you use some examples in teaching. Some people learn by using kids, by demonstration. You know, that's why Jesus was trying to make sure uh, it gave them a deep understanding while he was talking to them. Praise the Lord. Let's move forward because of our time. Yeah. To a 
explain things to them. Praise the Lord. Let's go to section C. We are still continuing with the parable of Jesus Christ. The weeds and explanation. This is an explanation. And I want us to, can somebody quickly read it? It's too much. <laughs> so, all right. Jesus left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the feet. At the disciples' request, Jesus interpreted the parable of the weeds. It was about the se separation of the wicked from the righteous. So, I think that makes the summary. Say, He said, yeah, oh, okay. Jesus eventually left the crowds and entered the house, probably one belonging to a disciple of his. There, Christ's follower privately asked him to clarify the meaning of the parable. He had told the crowds earlier concerning the weeds in the feed. Jesus applied his disciples by telling what each element in the story represented. Uh, we didn't read the whole something, but he explained to them the sower, when we're talking about the sow. The sower in that story is the son of man. Who is the son of man? Jesus Christ. Then he talk about the feed. The feed is the world. The seed, the children of the kingdom, the weeds, children of Satan, enemy. Hmm, that's the big enemy, Satan. The harvest, that is the end. Harvesters, the angel. So, uh, excuse me. So, in case of the real weed, in the real feed. So, um, the next question I have is if you could pull Jesus aside, and privately ask him one question, what will it be? Because of the parable he has been speaking, then the disciples, when they go to that private something, they ask him to explain. So if you are there, what kind of question? If you so what question? Will you ask? Yeah. You had the opportunity to ask him questions. Then you, you see the kind of powers he has demonstrated and everything. I will just ask him, I will just ask him, please, Jesus, assure me I will reign with you on the last day. Or just take me away. <laughs> That's, That's all. not a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other person? Nobody will ask him questions? Yeah. Are we going to come to the end of all this journey? We are tired. We are tired. 
Any other with questions? Why do you allow this uh, Satan to come? You have you are powerful. Why did you allow them to come to that uh, farm? <laughs> Any other one? Okay, two more. Praise because of our time. I will ask Jesus when we get to new head. What will happen there? Like we were studying yesterday in the house, and my daughter said, somebody said, ah, when we get to uh, the new head, is it not going to be boring? So what will happen after the new head has come and new heaven is up there? I want to know what will happen. Is it we're still going to get married, have children, say enjoy? Because I don't think we will just sit down and be singing in the new head. Uh -huh. So it's going to be born in any way. So I want to know what will happen. Praise the Lord. Well, for all what you ask Jesus, I'm not Jesus. So I don't. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I'm not Jesus, so <laughs> all, all I want to add is I will encourage us to keep on communicating with our Father. In your prayer, in your daily study of Bible, moving you closer to Jesus. Praise the Lord. But for all those questions, only Jesus can answer your question. Eh? Eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Another question before we move to the next section. Why is God waiting until the end of the age to punish the Ifudua? Huh? Praise the Lord. I think it's just giving them opportunity to, to repent and turn themselves into children of God before he will finally deal with them. Praise the Lord. Because God doesn't want to lose any soul. He doesn't want Satan to destroy us. He loves us. And he's giving us a chance to turn a limb leaf, to repent and come to him. He doesn't want to lose any soul. Praise the Lord. Section D. Oh, wow. Uh, the trail, the pier, and the net. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like trail, hidden in a feed. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then, in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that feed. Um, Jesus told two parables to illustrate the worth of God's kingdom. The parable of the treasure and of the pearl. The parable of the net is another story of defying separation of the righteous and the wicked. Since the disciples claimed to understand these parables, Jesus told them one more about a homeowner to encourage them to share their spiritual insight with others. The feed, I know we, we read that, that somebody finds something useful on the feed. That, ah, this thing is precious. So then they ran home, sold everything that he has. He hid that thing so that nobody else will see it, and sold everything that he has so that he can buy that feed. Um, maybe let me ask this question to, maybe we can get a better understanding. So 
Because it's like somebody went and sell everything that they have so that he can acquire that feet. What does it mean to give up everything? He sold everything. Just let it go for the kingdom. What does it mean? To give up everything for the kingdom. Hello, church. My brother, give it to him. What does it mean to give up everything for the kingdom? It means we put God first in everything we do. Everything we do, God comes first. That's the way of giving God everything we have. Okay. Uh, I'll just put it to do everything, anything necessary. Praise oh, the Lord. Okay. Sorry, I'm rushing because of the time. Yeah, in the kingdom of God, everything answers to the kingdom. In the kingdom of God, there is no illusion. In the kingdom of God, no one is a misfit. You have your place in it. But outside the kingdom, no matter what you know before you know the kingdom, you have not known nothing. Until you know the kingdom, until you enter the kingdom, you have not started living. So that everything is about the kingdom. God bless us. Well, Reverend, I mean, Bishop already answered part of my follow-up question. Say, why is that necessary? That you want to give everything for you to get to the kingdom. So why is it necessary? everything first. What are those things? Because when you don't know it, how do you give it up? So, what are those things that we give up for the kingdom of God? I say the early play, uh, be early player. Like uh, when having money in bad ways, Making rituals to get money, stealing. Mm -hmm. We can give up our time. You know, time to come to, to the house of God, time to study the word of God. Just like when we are in the teacher's class, that when God, I mean, a man of God tells you to give whatever you have in your account or whatever, and you are led by, you know that you are convinced with this dance spirit that that, that that person is led by God, and you give it to you without questioning authority of the man of God. It's like, I'm giving it to God. Giving our money. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it's very important that as believers, you give everything. Do everything that will not make you sin. Anything that you think can lead you to sin, you have to move away with it. You give it up. You, you run away from things that can draw you to the world. When we say the world, it's like, a hey, enjoyment gallon. You don't want to care about anything, but you decided, I'm giving all this for the sake of heaven. Praise the Lord. Yes. And all these things. Praise the Lord. Um, hallelujah. The first time I, I was made, made I was tried, I mean, I was made up my mind to follow God. My, the first question is that even though I have not known God, but I know that if you know, if you have not known, it's better. But then I, 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 the sin of no and not do is the word I was afraid most. Uh, the sin of what to know it and will not do it is the reason why I don't attend fellowship in the campus. Because I don't want to know it. Since I don't know it, I, I believe that. Even though I know it, but I say I have not had it. I've not confirmed it. People of God, it's good now. Say, hey, the kingdom of God first. Give it first. 
is dangerous for you to know it. When we are talking, a, a lot of the grammar said to anything that you enjoy more than God is an idol. That's what God is. Anything that you enjoy more than God is, a, is that your God. So when we are saying giving up everything, was so happy, thank God you are not you are not a sinner, you are not a fornicator. But some of you, you still have something that you enjoy more than God. So you, have, you enjoy your time. You enjoy your time. And you rather do double seal than to come to the church. And you have had it. And it, it's not a small sin. Because I'm saying to know the good, to know to do good. To know, know that they are teaching you now. Know that they are believing you now. To know to do. To know and do it you now is a sin. So your sin it never put that food that are doing hey, ah, ooh, in Branca. And the truth is that you that know to do good and not do it. Even though you are not seen, but don't do it. Your, your is greater than them. Okay. So I hate when we are talking like this and you are contributing. And you are already guilty yourself. But what I say, a time is coming that you yourself will be judged by your own testimony. So it's not that like when you, are, you get to heaven. Your world is judging you right by right now. What you are saying is judging you. That is dangerous. And so still bring this quick course on us. You said it. Because the Bible says, by a man's tongue, he'll be justified. And by a man's tongue, he'll be condemned. Don't condemn yourself, people of God. And God will us in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. So, um... Another question, I have another question here. Say, why is the concept of eternal punishment difficult for most non-Christians to accept? Why is the concept of eternal punishment difficult for most non-Christians to accept? Give it to Uncle K there. Too deep. Okay, give it to Pastor. Pastor so water. Say, so why is the concept of eternal punishment difficult for most non Christians to accept? Or they lack understanding. Praise the Lord. That's the good answer. He hit it right there. Because the non believer, they lack understanding. Then I, 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 let me quickly follow up that to this. He said, how is familiarity with word of God affecting the church today? Okay. Oh, <laughs> Jesus is rejected at Nazareth. Okay. We are in part E. I know we run out of time. Sorry about that. Coming to his hometown, Jesus began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Jesus returned to his hometown to teach, and there was, and there was met with disrespect. The people's familiarity with him blinded them to his true identity. So Jesus left without doing many miracles. So I jumped to that question when I asked you that. How is familiarity with the word of God affecting the church today? Because they were too familiar with Jesus, they really didn't care about real identity. Pastor, you want to help us? <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. 